Hello everyone, welcome once again to Reading Culture and our continuing look at Alfred Lord Tennyson's Petals of the King. We looked at uh, the origins of this particular version of the Arthurian myth and some of the sources for it, particularly Sir Thomas Mallory's Mordra Arthur, but today we're actually going to begin looking at the text itself. So we are going to begin by, well, looking at the first Idle, uh, the coming of Arthur, where Tennyson is going to present to us his version, in some ways uh, very much in keeping with other versions, but in others uh, also unique to himself, of the origin of Arthur. So Tennyson has these comments about Arthur, which may tell us a little bit about how he perceives his character. He says the following. How much of history we have in the story of Arthur is doubtful. Let not my readers press too hardly on details, whether for history or for allegory. Some think that King Arthur may be taken to typify conscience. He is anyhow meant to be a man who spent himself in the cause of honor, duty, and self-sacrifice, who felt and aspired with his nobler knights, though with a stronger and a clearer conscience than any of them, reverencing his conscience as his king. In short, God had not made since Adam was the man more perfect than Arthur, as an older writer says. Meor praetoritis, meor quefaturis regibus, the once and future king. The vision of Arthur as I have drawn him came upon me when, little more than a boy, I first lighted upon Mallory. So this is, I think, important uh, to think about insofar as we have Arthur described as really a king of conscience. Uh, there's a sense that his conscience really is the thing which makes him kingly. But we'll also see that while virtuous, there's a super, certain supernatural element to it. Uh, so in one of his sources, Wolfman's Brute from the 12th century, we get this description um, of Arthur as well. The time came that was chosen then when Arthur was born. So soon as he came on earth, elves took him. They enchanted the child with magic most strong. They gave him might to, to be the best of all knights. They gave him another thing, that he should be a rich king. They gave him the third, that he should live long. They gave to him the child virtues most good, so that he was most virtuous of all men alive. This the elves gave him, and thus the child thrived. So there's a sense in which, while he's virtuous, there's something supernatural about it. He's given the gift of virtue by elves other things. Now, this isn't in the source, but think about this as we look at how Tennyson treats it. The other thing that Tennyson is going to emphasize is this uh, cyclical kind of pattern, which begins with the birth of Arthur on the New Year. The coming of Arthur is on the night of the New Year. When he is wedded, the world is white with May. On a summer night, the vision of the Holy Grail appears. And the last tournament is in the yellowing autumn tide. Guinevere flees through the mists of autumn, and Arthur's death takes place at midnight in midwinter. The form of the coming of Arthur and of the passing is purposely more archaic than that of the other idols. The blank verse throughout each of the twelve idols varies according to the subject. So here we have the sense of this pattern, which will begin in this with a more archaic idol than the rest of them, and will end thusly as well at the end of the season. It begins a new year and in midwinter at midnight. So let's look at the actual poem itself. So it begins, the other grand, the king of Cameliard, had one fair daughter and none other child, and she was fairest of all flesh on earth, Guinevere, and in her is one delight. So we are we're actually introduced to Guinevere firstly, and we see that she is the one delight of Arthur. It goes on, for many a petty king, ere Arthur came, ruled in this isle being the British Isle, and ever waging war each upon the other, wasted all the land. And still from time to time the heathen hosts swarmed overseas and harried what was left, and so there grew great tracts of wilderness, wherein the beasts was ever more and more, but man was less and less, till Arthur came. Right, so there's a sense in which you have a, uh, you know, there's only petty kings before Arthur, there's no great kings and that there's this great heathen host that's arrayed against him, right, that these will be his enemies. And this, uh, this stanza ends uh, picking up again 
at about line 16. And after these, King Arthur, for a space, and through the puissance, that is the might of his round table, drew all their petty kingdoms under him, their king and head, and made a realm and reign. So there's this sense that all kings will be made subject to Arthur, and that his table around will. There's a sense in which the table around symbolically encompasses the whole world. Uh, at this, uh, the medieval worldview is that while they did not, contrary to popular belief, believe that the earth was flat, they believed that it was a sphere. Nevertheless, they believed that not knowing about North America or places like that, that the, the land was a disk surrounded by an endless ocean. So there's, so there's a sense in which the, the table around really represents all of the world. All right, so, uh, so there's more descriptions here of what the world is like. You know, men being described as being in a bestial state, right? They're, they're, they're like animals. Um, and, there's a, and there's a sense that even Roman domination, right, that's just symbolized by the imperial eagle of Rome, is preferable to this lawless state, even though it leads to all kinds of horrors. Uh, so this is at about uh, line 33. And King Leodogran groaned for the Roman legions here again, and Caesar's eagle. Then his brother King Urien assailed him, last a heathen horde, reddening the sun with smoke and earth with blood, and on the spike that split the mother's heart, spitting the child break on him, till, amazed, he knew not whither he should turn for aid. So you remember in our discussion of Henry V, right? we had this horrific threat of uh, Henry before the gates of Far Floor, saying that he, if they do not surrender, right, they will see their infant spitted upon pikes. Well, it is made reality in this world that is uh, described before the coming of Arthur. But this is how the coming of Arthur is described at line 41. But for he heard of Arthur newly crowned, though not without an uproar made by those who cried, he is not Uther's son. The king sent to him saying, arise and help us thou, for here between the man and beast we die. So he's asking for Arthur's help, but we get the sense already that there's this uproar about Arthur's crowning. As Arthur goes out, we get this uh, significant scene at line 47, where he is seen for the first time by Guinevere, although he is dressed like an ordinary knight. But we get the sense that he can feel her gaze upon him. And there's a sense that his kingliness is hidden at this point, but it will be revealed. And so as the story goes on, he drives the heathens out. Uh, but it turns out that these other petty kings do not believe that he is actually with her son. And so they resist him and his rule. They claim that he is the son of another, right? A lesser, for instance, they uh, accuse his foster father, Anton, of being his real son. Um, but we're going to see Arthur here uh, be wanting to really prove himself for the purposes of Guinevere. So at line 84, we see him saying that, uh, for saving I be joined to her, that is Guinevere, that is the fairest under heaven, I seem as nothing in the mighty wor world, and cannot will my will, nor work my work wholly, nor make myself in mine own realm victor and lord. So he's trying to overcome these petty kings, but he feels that he actually can't even do this without Guinevere. So a necessary is she to him. So we get this uh, great description of the battle at lines 90, about 94 to 133. Uh, thereafter, as he speaks, who tells the tale, when Arthur reached a field of battle bright, with pitched pavilions of his foe, the world was all so clear about him that he saw the smallest rock far on the faintest hill, and even in high day the morning star. So when the king had set his banner broad, it went from either side with trumpet blast, and shouts and clarions shrilling into blood, a long lance battle let their horses run, and now the barons and the kings prevailed, and now the king is here and there that war went swaying, for the powers who walked the world made lightnings and great thunders over him, and dazed all eyes, till Arthur by main might and mightier of his hands with every blow, and leading all his knighthood through the kings Caradas, Urien, Cradlemont of Wales, Claudius and Clarence of Northumberland, the king Brandegoras of Lantagor, and Angusant of Erin, Urganor, and Lot of Orkney. So there's this sense that even the elements themselves are aiding uh, Arthur as the light the sky is flashing and blinding his foes before him. Uh, we also are going to get just a little bit further down uh, a first reference to Lancelot. Right. Uh, well, actually, let's pick this up maybe at 
Actually, we'll pick it up where we left off at 115. And before a voice as dreadful as the shout of one who sees to one who sins, and deems himself alone and all the world asleep, they swerved and break, flying, and Arthur called to stay the band, the brands that hacked among the flyers. Ho, oh, they yield, so like a painted battle, the war stood silence, living quiet as the dead. And in the heat, in the heart of Arthur, joy was Lord. Uh, note there's going to be an echo of that later on in the poem. Joy in, in the heart of Arthur, joy was Lord. He laughed upon his warrior, whom he loved and honored most. This is Lancelot, who will play such an important role throughout the uh, the story. And from this victory, he secures Guinevere, or at least so it, was, it seems. However, uh, we see that uh, her father, Leodegren, still doubts Arthur's birth and consequently his worthiness for the hand of his daughter, if it turns out that Arthur is not truly the son of King Uther Pendragon. And so at line 52, we get the introduction of the character of Merlin the Magician. Uh, we get a sense that the master of Merlin, line 157, uh, has written a chronicle that tells of Merlin, but also the birth of Arthur. And then we get an account of Arthur's birth by the knight Bedivere, at line 185. So he begins, he says, uh, the prince and warrior Gola, he that held Tintagel Castle by the Cornish Sea, was wedded with a winsome wife, Gern, and daughters had she borne him, once one whereof Lot's wife, the Queen of Orkney. Bellicent hath ever like a loyal sister cleaved to Arthur, but a son she had not born, and Uther cast upon her eyes of love. But she, a stainless wife to Gorloi, so loathed the bright dishonor of his love that Gorloi and King Uther went to war, and overthrown was Gorloi and slain. Then Uther, in his wrath and heat, besieged Egern within Tintagel, where her men, seeing the mighty swarm about her walls, left her and fled. And Uther entered in, and there was none to call to, call to but himself. So compassed by the power of the king, and forced she was to wed him in her tears, and with a shameful swiftness. Afterward, not many moons, King Arthur died himself, moaning and wailing for an heir to rule after him, lest the realm should go to rack. That same night, the night of the new year, by reason of the bitterness and grief that vexed his mother, all born his time, all before his time was Arthur born, and all as soon as born, delivered to a, at a secret postern gate to Merlin, to be holden far apart until his hour should come, because the lords of that fierce day were as the lords of this, wild beasts, and surely would have torn the child piecemeal among them, had they known. For each but sought to rule for his own self and hand, and many hated Uther for the sake of the boy. Before Merlin took the child and gave him to Sir Anton, an old knight, an ancient friend of Uther, and his wife nursed the young prince and reared him with her own, and no man knew. And ever since the lords have fought in like wild beasts among themselves, so that the realm has gone to rack. But now this year, when Merlin, for his hour had come, brought Arthur forth and set him in the hall, proclaiming, Here is Uther's heir, your king. A hundred voices cried away with him, No king of ours, a son of Gorloi he, or else the child of Anton, no king, or else base born. Yet Merlin threw his craft, and while the people clamored for a king, had Arthur crowned. But after the great lords banded, and so break out in open war. So in this story, we see this uh, right, account of Arthur, Arthur's birth. Again, he's born in the new year. He's delivered to a secret back door to Merlin, uh, who takes him and eventually is able to use his, his craft as his magic art to secure the crowning of Arthur. There's a sense that people are clamoring for a king, though. Nevertheless, this is rejected by many of these petty kings and other lords who war against him. So we see the uh, ultimate effects of this um, uh, in this uh, hostility towards Arthur, but ultimately Arthur is indeed king. And we see him presented indeed in a very kingly visage at uh, about line 266 here, when he speaks finally to his knights at the table round. He says, but when he spake and cheered his table round with large divine and comfortable words, Beyond my tongue to tell thee, I beheld from eye to eye through all their order flash a momentary likeness of the king. And ere it left their faces, through the cross and rolled around it, and the crucified, down from the casement over our 
with their flame color vert and azure in three rays, one falling upon each of three fair queens who stood in silence near his throne. And friends of Arthur gazing on him, Paul with bright, sweet faces, who will help him at his need. So we get this picture of Arthur as almost presented in a divine kind of way, right? There's a set where he's, well, he's described as uh, greeting him with large divine and comfortable words, and that the tongue cannot even express what these words were. And we get the sense that above Arthur is stained glass with a cross, picture of the crucified one, uh, Jesus Christ, and probably other saints, and that the light is shining through it, so that the light shining through the image of Christ and falling on Arthur, and ultimately through the stained glass on the rest of the men. So we get this association of Arthur with the light of Christ here. All right, shortly following this section, we are going to get the introduction of the Lady at the Lake. This is around line 282. So the Lady of the Lake famously is the person who gives King Arthur his sword, Excalibur. Uh, the story of the sword and the stone is not the story of, a, of Excalibur, that's a separate story, or at least it is in the original versions. Um, so Excalibur does not come from the stone, but is given to him by the Lady of the Lake. So according to Tennyson, he says that uh, traditionally the Lady of the Lake is a symbol of the Christian church. So we could maybe keep that in mind in terms of how she is presented and how she functions in the story. Indeed, at line 290, we get this uh, specific description that her voice is a voice as of the watchers which is it's a very eschatological image. Uh, eschatology is the, uh, the study of the uh, Christian end times. And there's this sense in which this is recalling a line from Revelation. So there's, there's, there's a feeling here that Arthur is getting power from uh, these kind of, uh, not just ancient, but also things which exist outside of time, right? So that the power that he wields is more than simply a secular power. So he's given Excalibur, and there's, there's an interesting uh, series of things written on it. So on one side, uh, it says, cast me away. But on the other side, it says, take me. So it's a paradox, right? Um, and it, it appears here that, uh, well, Merlin follows this up by saying, uh, take it. But counsel some, take that and strike. The time to cast away is yet far off. So there's a sense in which both are at various times appropriate. This is almost assuredly referring to uh, a line from the Bible, uh, from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3, verse 6, which has a line that there's a time to gather up and a time to cast away. So there's a sense in which this paradoxical inscription on the sword is indicative of the various seasons in which it will need to be used. And this sword, Excalibur, Excalibur will ultimately be the instrument of his conquest. And so we get this story, but uh, Lildegren ultimately ends up asking. Um, he says, "Bring in his own dear, uh, his his own dear sister, the daughter of Gorloi, and Egern, right? Who is right? At least she asks, is is she his sister? In other words, is Arthur actually the son of Gorloi? And she's very coy about it. She won't say. Um, so we're going to see that there's still some kind of suspicion here." Um, and we get that also at line 325. And then the queen made answer, what know I? For dark my mother was in eyes and hair, and dark in hair and eyes am I. And dark was Gorloi. Yea, and dark was Uther too. Well, nigh to blackness, but this king is fair beyond the race of Britons and of men. Moreover, always in mind I hear a cry from out the dawning of my life, a mother weeping, and I hear her say, oh, that ye had some brother, pretty one, to guard thee on the rough ways of the world. So there's this sense in which there's this kind of suspicion because he, he is fair, unlike Uther, but also unlike Roloi, since it's almost an unearthly fairness that he has. All right, so we get in the following section, uh, the reentry of Merlin, who's described as being able to walk unseen, uh, which is a common trope. And then we get the uh, more description of the birth of Arthur uh, and the death of Merlin, which uh, right, we, we see that there's this kind of uh, equalization, uh, a paralleling, right? As Uther dies, so uh, Arthur is born. And this is at line 365, where it starts. Uh, Uther, before he died, and on the night, when Uther in Tintagil passed away, moaning and wailing for an heir, the two left the still king, and passing forth to breathe, and from the castle gateway, by the chasm descending through the dismal night, a night in which the bounds of heaven and earth were lost, beheld so high upon the dreary deeps, 
It seemed in heaven a ship, the shape of rather dragon winged, and all from stem to stern, bright with shining people on the decks, and gone as soon as seen. So there's a sense in which Arthur is going to come on the waves. He's going to come in a ship that's shaped like a dragon. Dragon, of course, being the image that's associated with Arthur throughout. We've talked a little bit already about the symbolism of dragons, right? Of of chaos and of uh, right base passions and things like this. We have to remember the importance of taking the symbol of that thing which you are fighting and using it as your own to show you're con you know you're conquering over it. But we'll hold that in mind for now. And then the two dropped to the cove and watched the great sea fall, wave after wave, each mightier than the last, the last, a ninth one, gathering half the deep and full of voices, slowly rose and plunged, roaring, and all the wave was in a flame. And down the wave and in the flame was born a naked babe, and rode to Merlin's feet, who stooped and caught the babe and cried, The king, here is an heir for Uther. So there's a sense of that we get this wave after wave panning, it's the ninth wave which brings uh, Arthur nine is a very important number in uh, Celtic uh, numerology and symbolism and, and in Christian as well uh, but it's certainly significant that it's the ninth wave and the fringe of that breaker sweeping up the strand lashed at the wizard as he spoke the word and all hands all around him rose in the fire so that the child and he were clothed in fire and presently thereafter followed calm the sky and stars and this same child, he said, is he who reigns, nor could I part in peace till this were told. And saying this, the seer went through the strait and dreadful pass of death, not ever to be questioned any more, save on the further side. But when I met Merlin and asked for what he said were truth, the shining dragon and the naked child descending in the glory of the seas, he laughed, as is his wont, and answered me in riddling triplets of old time, and said, Rain, rain, and sun are rainbow in the sky. A young man will be wiser by and by. An old man's wit may wander ere he die. Rain, rain, and sun are rainbow on the lee. And truth is this to me and that to thee. In truth or clothed or naked, let it be. Rain, sun, and rain, and the free bosom blows. Rain, sun, rain, and sun, and where is he who knows? From the great deep to the great deep he goes. There's a sense that right, Merlin should know these things. Right, He's kind of a prophet and a seer. Um, but when asked about, are these things true? Was, was Arthur really carried on the waves in this dragon ship? He answers in riddles, right? And it, which is very, uh, frustrating for, uh, right? When he's trying to find the truth. Um, but we do get this, this answer at the end a bit from the great deep to the great deep, from the great deep to the great deep he goes. So there's a sense that Arthur comes from the great deep and to the great deep he will return. And so we get another prophecy here in this next uh, stanza. So Merlin riddling angered me, but, th but thou fear not to give this king thine only child, Guinevere. So great bards of him will sing hereafter and dark sayings from of old, ranging and ringing through the minds of men and echoed by old folk beside their fires for comfort after their wage work is done. Speak of the king and Merlin in our time hath spoken also, not in jest, and sworn though men may wound him that he will not die, but pass again to come, then or now, utterly smite the heathen underfoot, till these and all men hail him for their king. So this, here we get the prophecy of the once and future king. That is to say, the king who, while once king, has passed away, not truly died, and will come again, and will be the future king to save the land of Britain. And so finally, Lodogan is convinced, and uh, Arthur secures his marriage with Guinevere. Significantly, we see at line 451, that it is Lancelot that conveys Guinevere to Arthur, which is the innovation of Tennyson's version. We see the Saint Dubric will be the one who marries Arthur, Arthur and Guinevere. And uh, as we see down at, uh, this is about line 464, maybe. Or actually, let's go a little bit before we see this description. Uh, that, uh, let's, uh, sorry, maybe before 59. For shone the fields of May through open door, the sacred altar blossomed quite with May. The son of May descended on their king. They gazed on all earth's beauty in their queen. Rolled incense and there passed along the hymns a voice as of the waters. Remember the Lady of the Lake. Same description. While the two swear at the shrine of Christ to deathless love. And Arthur said, Behold, thy doom is mine. So remember the old meaning of doom is judgment but still keep that in mind the i doom guinevere is mine he says 
Indeed, we're going to get a bit of a harbinger of this boon of Arthur and his knights uh, in the description that begins at line 475. So de Brick said that when they left the shrine, great lords from Rome before the portal stood in scornful stillness gazing as they passed. Uh, Rome had been the ruler of Britain. And while they faced a city all on fire with sun and cloth of gold, the trumpets blew and Arthur's knighthood sang before the king. Blow trumpet for the world is white with May. Blow trumpet the long night hath rolled away. Well, through the living world, let the king reign. To Rome or heathen rule in Arthur's realm, flash brand and lance, fall battle axe upon helm. Fail, fall battle axe and flash brand, let the king reign. Strike for the king and live. His knights have heard that God hath told the king a secret word. Fall battle axe and flash brand, let the king reign. Well, trumpet, he will lift us from the dust. Well, trumpet, live the strength and die the lust. Claim the battle axe and clash the brand, let the king reign. Strike for the king and die, and if thou diest, the king is king, and ever wills the highest. Clang battle axe and clash brand, let the king reign. Blow for our son is mighty in his may, blow for our son is mightier day by day. Clang battle axe and clash brand, let the king reign. The king will follow Christ, and we the king, in whom high God hath breathed a secret thing. Fall battle axe and flash brand, let the king reign. So there's this sense in which this, this oncoming battle to establish this kingdom is now joined that will carry through to the end of the poem. So Arthur claims he will follow Christ, and then his knights will follow the king. And so we'll have this hierarchy that leads up to perfection. Um, but will they actually manifest that? And so it goes on. So saying the knighthood moving to their hall, they're at the banquet, those great lords from Rome, the slowly fading mistress of the world, strode in and claimed their tribute as of yore. And Arthur spake, Behold, for these have sworn to wage my wars and worship me their king. The old order changeth, yielding place to new. Take note of this line, the old order changeth, yielding place to new. We will see it repeated again. And we that fight for our fair father Christ, seeing that you be grown too weak and old to drive the heathen from your Roman wall, that's Hadrian's wall, the old Roman wall in the north of Britain, no tribute we will pay. So those great lords drew back in wrath, and Arthur strove with Rome. So he will no more pay tribute to Rome, and thus battle is drawn between Rome itself and Arthur. And so this it'll ends by uh, with this final stanza, and Arthur and his knighthood for a space were all one will, only for a space where they have one will. And through that strength, the strength of that united will, the king drew in the petty princedoms under him. Right, finally all the petty kings are conquered, fought, and in twelve great battles. These are 12 battles which go back to Nennius, the first reference of uh, Arthur, well over a thousand years ago. Uh, and in 12 great battles overcame the heathen hordes and made a realm and reigned. So ultimately, Arthur has the victory. He overcomes the heathen hordes, he overcomes the petty kings, he even resists Rome, and he establishes his kingdom. And for a while, here at the beginning, he and his knights are of one will. If this were all we were to read, it would seem quite definitive, the kind of hero that Arthur is, nearly divine, a reflection of the perfect man, Christ. And so finally, we have this victory, and it seems that all is established, but already we're getting hints of things, right? That for now, they are of one will, but we get a sense that they will not always be so. Already we know that Arthur's doom is tied in with Guinevere. Already we know that Lancelot is he who conveyed her, what he loves, Arthur loves Lancelot the best of any one of his knights, but there seems to be this sense that something is lurking on the horizon. Now, of course, throughout the Idols of the King, we see many adventures of many different kinds of knights. But overall, what we are getting is the story of Arthur's kingdom and of the Knights of the Table Round and their eventual fall fragmenting of their wills and desires, the fragmenting even of their loyalty in some cases. So as we continue to look at some more of Tennyson's idols, keep in mind this opening one where we have the establishment of the kingdom of Arthur. Remember, he is described as a king of conscience. There's a sense in which his conscience is higher, his virtue is greater. And we have this sense that perhaps this comes from some kind of divine source, right? It's, it's, it's elven maid who comes upon the ninth wave and the ship, the dragon ship. And right now he's conquering the dragon. The dragon is subdued, but it may not always be so in the land of Camelot. 